she's here. Here is Judy Kuhn. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming out so early in the morning. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming. Oh, great. Look at you guys. You're all dressed up. You look so pretty. <laughs> all right. How are you today? I am good. I'm good. I'm this, good. This Happy to be here. Is this your first time in Baltimore? No, I was here a few years ago for the wedding. Of my, my husband has a cousin here. We okay. came down here for his wedding. I'm trying to think if that's the only time I've been here. I can't remember now. Uh, yeah, but I love Baltimore. It's a great city. Well, that, that is awesome. Um, we oh. have a, is there's a little there's feedback. Those. Okay. Um, oh, yes. More people coming in. It's awesome. Hello, come coming on in. in. <laughs> you haven't missed anything yet. I sang, but it's okay to miss that. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that, trust me. So um, we're going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to have questions. So I want everybody to think of really, really awesome questions. And you're also going to get a little bonus. There might be some singing. So that'll be... Oh. <laughs> You already get claps and you haven't even done anything yet. So, you started out um, on Broadway. Well, I wouldn't say I started out on Broadway, but my career has mostly been in the theater. Yes. Yeah. Off so. Broadway, on Broadway, regional. Well, in theater. Yes. Yeah. In theater, theater. yes. Yeah, theater. <clears throat> so, um, you were in Drood? The Mystery of Edwin Drood yes. was my, my very first Broadway show. And so, is this something that you always knew that this is what I want to do? You know, I just, I, from the time I was probably your age over there, I just loved the theater. I thought it was a magical place to be. I had this weird instinct as a young person that you know, they talk about the, the willing suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. I understood that in an instinctual way. Like, I understood that I was watching actors and scenery and costumes. So I knew that it, they weren't real, really those people in that place. But I was completely transported, and I believed them. And I always had a fascination with that sort of magical transformation. And I think there was something in me that always wanted to be a part of that somehow. What was your introduction to the theater? What, what sparked that? Well, there was, I, I grew up in a suburb of Washington, D.C. in Bethesda, Maryland. Yes. <laughs> there are some, Mar I, I, <laughs> there are some Bethesda-ers here, I guess. Um, and there was, um, there was a park near me. It had been a, an amusement park, and then it was changed into a, a kind of public park called Glen Echo. I don't know. Okay, there's a, okay, we're, we're getting, we're narrowing down the crowd to that particular place, and ge geographical location. Um, and there was a, a theater company there that still exists called Adventure Theater. You know that too, okay. And it was a children's theater company, and it was, I, I, my parents took us when we were very little to see Adventure Theater. And one of the things I really remember, and I was really little, so it's a very, dis, you know, vivid and obviously important memory of mine. One of the things they always did at Adventure Theaters after the show, the actors would come out in their costumes, and you could meet them and shake their hands. And I think that's when I kind of got caught on to this idea that these are actors. And I, I was just, I thought it was magic. And you were like, hey. Yeah, I, maybe when this? I was four, I didn't think, oh, I'm going to be an actress. Yeah. But um, I definitely, that's, I, the bug somehow infected me then. Well, that's, <laughs> that is great. Um, so you have been in numerous um, plays. Um, relating to the Comic Con, you were in Fun Home. 
Alison uh-huh. Bechdel's. Oh, you know, I never home. made that connection exactly. Oh. But yes, it's true. It, it's a, it was a, a, a musical play based on a graphic novel. Mm-hmm. So yes, it started life as a cartoon. Yeah, it was, <clears throat> it, it's one of, I love it. It's yeah, one it's of, incredible. It's, book. So did you, did you read it before or did you read it after? Well, when I was asked, I, I was asked to do one of the very early readings of the show. And they said it was based on this graphic memoir, so I went and got it and I read it and I thought it was incredible and had no idea how they were gonna turn it into a stage play. (laughs) But they did and it it was a really remarkable piece, a remarkable piece of writing, very impactful on me and everybody who saw it. I mean, I've never been in something that had such an impact on its audiences. That's amazing. One, one of my favorite, I'm sure you guys, it's your, one of your favorites too, is Les Miserables. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it is, it's one of the greatest, it's just a great soundtrack. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's just, it's an amazing thing. And you got to be two different characters in that. <laughs> well, I was, I was in the original Broadway cast. Mm-hmm. I played Cosette. Yes. And then um, many, Many years later, I played Fantine briefly on Broadway. We just went in for a few months to replace Lea Salonga, actually. <clears throat> and um, they had been trying to get me to come back and play Fantine for a long time, and just never was the right time. And that then that was the right time. So, and there was a <laughs> there was a piece in Playbill, the online theater magazine, um, about my going into the show to play Fantine, and the headline was. I am my own mother. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. That's funny. Um, So when you were there at the beginning of all this, before Mm -hmm. it was like established, did you have any idea when you were doing this that it was going to be like just blow up and become a movie and, you know? No, I mean, well, I mean, it had been a big hit in London. Yeah. You know, it had started at the Royal Shakespeare Company. It had moved to the West End. It was a big hit. And um, people were, to, I, I don't know how many of you out there know of this stage adaptation of Nick, the Dickens novel, Nicholas Nickleby, that was done at the Royal Shakespeare Company and by the same, was um, created and, and, and then directed by the same directors as who directed Trevor Nunn and John Carrad, who directed Les Mis. And a lot of people talked about this, the Les Miserables as being a sort of musical Nicholas Nickleby, a, a, a kind of stage adaptation of an epic novel. Um, and uh, so, and I was a big fan of Nicholas Nickleby, so when I was asked to audition for Les Miserables, I was very excited. Um, but, you know, I don't think at that, I mean, it was Les Miserables, it wasn't yeah. Les Mis yet. Yeah. And it was very, you know, who knew what it was gonna become. I do remember though, we went, to, we played the Kennedy Center before we opened on Broadway. We did two months out of town before we were on Broadway. And um, I can remember going to the theater, I, I don't know if it was for an early preview or tech rehearsals, I don't remember, but. I remember walking into the Kennedy Center and seeing this line at the box office that went all the way down the hall and out the door, and I thought, oh, I guess we're a hit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was very surprising to me, and then, of course, you know, it became what it became, and you know, it was very exciting to be a part of that. Yeah, that it's, it's, it's incredible. I got made fun of a lot in school because I loved theater and I was always listening to soundtracks. And Why so. do people make fun of people who love the theater? Know. That's just, it's a crime. Well, between, <laughs> between that and, and my Star Wars, it was, I was really popular, <laughs> you know, with my tube socks. So I um, had Chewbacca <laughs> on them. So I was kind of asking okay. for it, I guess. Um, so. <laughs> What was, the, what was the whole process like, like going into that and, and auditioning and? Well, I mean, I had several auditions. Actually, for more than one character, as I recall, I think they were trying to figure out what to do with me. Um, <laughs> and, but the rehearsal process was very exciting. It was, 
you know, a process a la the Royal Shakespeare Company. We did a week of improvisations to kind of understand the, the period and the physicality of the characters and relationships. And um, it was really terrifying <laughs> and exciting. And the thing that was kind of remark I mean, Trevor Nunn is a genius director um, and he has this remarkable, he, he was really a teaching director and really taught me so much about storytelling. I mean, he would say things when he directed you, if you cr when you cross on this line, it tells the story that. And I, I never thought of it that way. And, and we know that instinctually when we look at movies or we look at um, TV or uh, in the theater, when someone looks up on, it, it, you're, you're learning something about the story, you're learning something about the character. And he was so specific in that way that it was very, it was a great, great learning experience. Well, and speaking of learning, you also teach song interpretation? I do, I do. I just taught a master class in uh, Nashville a couple weeks ago. I love teaching that. I mean, I, I love, I love storytelling. I mean, that's why I love the theater, is I just love storytelling. So I love getting, especially young people who are singing songs, to understand that they are storytellers, not singers. You know, that, that what they sound like is not important. It's the story they have to tell. So I'm, I'm really intrigued by, by, by that. So like, what is that process of, like, how, how would you explain, like, this is what this this course is about, or this is what this class is about? Well, I mean, that really, I, I, I really, I, I like to work on lyrics um, speaking them so that you understand what the words are that you're saying. I try to get people to understand that uh, a song is a scene in, between you and another character, or you and the audience, that when you start a song, you don't know where it's gonna go. I mean, acting always is that weird thing of a character not knowing what's gonna happen next while the actor does know. And so you plan, but you can't, you have to make it unplanned, if that makes sense. So that, um, and I try to explain to people when they're singing a song, they can't know what the end, where they're going. That every line that they sing and or slash say, because I, think of it as speech to music, um, could be the end, but there's a reason that they have to go on, and that's where the discovery happens. Why do you need to go on? Why do you need to say the next thing and the next thing? And when you're done, where have you, where have you come from, and where have you gotten to? Have you okay. gotten what you wanted? Have you not gotten what you wanted? Are you gonna leave the room, or are you gonna stick around? You know, that, that's... And so where, I mean, where did you teach this, like, person in person, or do it online? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, the last yeah. few years, it's mostly been online. <laughs> I prefer everything is in person, that everything be in person, so. I mean, that's what the theater, they, how can the theater exist online? It has to be in person, really. It is, it's a completely different experience. Yeah, you have to be in the same room as the audience and the other actors and... So what has been the most fun you've had on a, in a theatrical experience? Oh, that's so hard. <laughs> that's like asking me to choose between my children, though I only have one child, so I don't have to do that. Um, <laughs> so it, and she's not the favorite, that's a bad day. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I always say, you're my favorite child. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I like to think that it's the last thing I did. I just did this production of Assassins, in, which is a Stephen Sondheim, John Weidman piece, extraordinary piece of writing that I just did in New York, and it was so fun. It was an amazing cast. We, had, we were all, we, it was off-Broadway in this wonderful little theater, and we were all crammed into one dressing room. Yes, the show had to close a week early because of COVID. <laughs> Um, my husband got COVID, he gave it to me, I gave it to half the class, the cast in that little tiny dressing room, 
and we had to close the show a week early, but we made it that far, and um, it was really, it was so fun and exciting, and it was wonderful. Um, but I would say also Fun Home maybe was the most profound and creative. I mean, I've never been involved in the, uh, the development of a new piece from such an early stage of its development. So I feel like all the actors who were involved in that really put their stamp on it. Um, and that was really exciting. And it was an incredible group of creative artists who were involved in it. And it just, it was really meaningful. So is, speak of with Fun Home, I mean, is there, is there a role that you've done that's like affected you personally? Well, definitely that yeah. affected me in many ways personally. Um, I don't know, you know, I've been really lucky. I, so many of the things I've done have been, have affected me personally, either because I've learned something new about the world or I've grown as an actor or I met people who have become an important part of my life, mm -hmm. either personally or artistically. So I feel very lucky in that way. <clears throat> okay, that's yeah. awesome. Um, does anybody have questions? I, do we have a microphone up here or? Just want them to holler I think it if out. If you shout, we can hear. Yeah. All right. Yes. Right here. Oh, uh, oh, well, Alison Bechtel is the, the cartoonist who wrote the book. The stage production was written, the music was written by Janine Tesori, and the book and lyrics by Lisa Crone, both incredible writers. They actually were the first female writing team to win a Tony Award for Best Score. Awesome. Yes. Yes, that can be applauded. Um, I remember Janine that night when um, she accepted the Tony, she said, she talked about the, her journey as a woman, first as a conductor and then as a composer, songwriter, and how she had never known that she could be a conductor on Broadway until she saw the only, uh, only woman in the pit doing this. And she said that night, as in her acceptance speech, she said, you have to see it to be it. And I think that's really true. So I hope when that night she, they inspired a lot of young, budding female composers and that's great. lyricists out there. That's great. Maybe you guys. <laughs> Over here. Go ahead. You. Yeah. Um, what, were, what were your thoughts about playing in the American <laughs> Well, uh, honestly, at the time, I didn't really think about it that much. Though, I have to say, the reason I wound up doing Pocahontas was because um, I had uh, done the demo. Alan Menken, who wrote the music, and Stephen Schwartz, who wrote the lyrics, had written the song, Colors of the Wind, and they, th the idea was being pitched to Disney. And um, they were putting together a demo package. And so they asked me if I would record the song, which I did in Alan Menken's home studio with him at the piano, basically. Um, and much later, uh, I ran into Steven somewhere and he said, oh, Disney's gonna make Pocahontas, but unfortunately they're not gonna cast you because they, they wanna cast a, a Native American actor, singer. And I thought, oh, okay, that makes sense. And um, I guess they tried F you. <laughs> And the head of the studio had gotten so used to hearing my voice, he kept saying, I don't like that as much. So <laughs> finally, they came back to me and said they wanted me to sing the songs, and they found, they, they sort of did it backwards. Usually they do this the other way around. They found a Native American actress, wonderful Irene Bedard, whose speaking voice weirdly matched my singing voice. I mean, it was pretty seamless. Um, and so she did all the dialogue and I did all the songs. So I kind of snuck in there, kind of. <laughs> so I, I knew that, I mean, even, you know, this was almost 30 years ago, but they were thinking about that and the, that, and the importance of that representation, but I just felt lucky, <laughs> basically, <laughs> to get to do it. Oh. oh. Oh, 
Well, there's so always, you know, the bucket list of roles, and you hope to get them in before you get too old to do them. <laughs> um, wow, I don't know. You know, I've never been, and maybe to my detriment, I've never been someone who thought, oh, well, this is the path I should be on, I should do that, and I should do that. But I just always want to do things that are well-written and that are complex and interesting and, you know, challenging. You know, the, in a, this role I played in Assassins never would have occurred to me. I, I didn't, it, I played Sarah Jane Moore, who was the, it was a kind of crazy woman who tried to kill Gerald Ford. Now, she, this, the, the, for those of you who don't know what Assassins is, it's a kind of brilliant piece about nine presidential assassins or would-be assassins who kind of meet, you know, everyone from J John Wilkes Booth to Lee Harvey Oswald, and they sort of all c meet in this nether world where, you know, they meet across centuries, and, um, and it's really an exploration, very timely exploration, um, even though it was written 30 years ago, of sort of political violence and what the American, what, what does the American dream mean? And anyway, but the way Sarah Jane Moore is written in this piece is a complete char comic character. She is the comic relief of the show, and she's cuckoo and kooky, and the director of this production, who I've worked with a number of times, had said to me, will you come play Sarah Jane Moore? And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I really didn't think it was a part I'd ever play. And I discovered that I could play it, and I did play it, and it was a wonderful experience. So I sort of feel like you never know what peop what's going to come your way, and you just have to be open to whatever it is, and even if it terrifies you, as this did, you just go for it. Oh my God, there have been so many, I wouldn't know where to begin. <laughs> a murder, a, a, a weapon that wasn't there that I was supposed to kill myself with, a, a piece of scenery that almost ran me over <laughs> when I did a production of a show called Chess. There were these big pieces of scenery that moved around the stage and I was do playing a scene and they had people inside them. They were these towers and they literally had crew people inside them and they followed these paths on the stage and sometimes they got lost <laughs> and I was playing the scene and I'm talking scenery that was like, I don't know, tw uh, you know, I don't know, 12, 15 feet high, huge, like weighing many tons. And I remember playing this scene and seeing out of the corner of my eye this big tower coming straight towards us. And I just put, in the middle of the scene, I just put my hand out like this so that he'd feel the resistance. <laughs> and my beloved scene partner <laughs> said to me later, I will never forget the image of little teeny tiny Judy stopping a two-ton piece of scenery with one hand while playing a scene. <laughs> So yeah, there have been many. Okay. Right. <laughs> Right. Um, he was asking about the movie Tick, Tick, Boom. I don't know how many of you saw it. That was um, directed by Lynn manuel Miranda and was uh, sort of inspired by the life of Jonathan Larson, who, was a compo who, who wrote Rent and died very young of a congenital heart uh, thing. Um, but I played John uh, Jonathan Larson in the movie was played by Andrew Garfield and um, I played his mother. Um, and yeah, I thought, wow, I'm old enough to play Andrew Garfield's mother, <laughs> okay. All right, I'll get used to that. Um, <laughs> uh, 
So he asked me what it was like to be a part of that. Well, I loved, I, I mean, I loved being a part of it. Um, Lynn is, of course, a man of the theater and is a theater lover, and he loves theater artists. And he just populated that movie with theater artists who he liked. And I thought that was a beautiful thing in and of itself, but it was made especially beautiful because the theater had been shut down for almost a year at that point, and all these theater artists were unemployed. And the, move, the, the film and television business was just starting to go back into production. And um, so it was sort of like he was giving a gift to all these people who had been out of work and sitting at home and um, waiting for work to come back. And in that way, it felt extra special too and so there was a really despite the fact this you know we shot that movie in November of 2020 October November of 2020 so it was you know the COVID was still very much with us and nobody was vaccinated yet and so the COVID uh, you know restrictions and protocols on set were unbelievable. I had to be alone. I, it was shot in New York where I live, but I had to be alone in a hotel room for eight days before I was allowed on set. Um, and, uh, and on set, you know, we were masks and shields and you couldn't, you know, you had to go to a special place to eat. And it was, cr it was crazy, but they got through the whole shooting of that movie without having to shut down ever. So it was kind of, I, you know, it was obviously what they needed to do. Um, so it was, you know, it was just, there was a great feeling on the set of just people just were so happy to be there and felt honored to be there. And Lynn is a wonderful person and warm and appreciative. And it was, they shot everything really fast, which was <laughs> really hard. But <laughs> anyway, it was good. It was really good. And, and the movie itself is a love letter to the theater because it's a love letter to a theater artist and they performed in it as if, it, and we, it, some of it was shot in a theater, you know, in a New York theater that had been closed for a year and wasn't going to open for several more months. So it was, it was pretty special. Thank you for asking. I have a question here. Yes. Oh, she asked that she, she said that Pocahontas is one of her favorite girl power, is that right, M m characters in, the, in a movie, and what was it like to play her? I mean, I guess I'd say that, you know, since I didn't play the whole character, I sang the songs, I feel like the messages, particularly in Colors of the Wind, the messages are really strong messages. And... Sadly, that song seems to become more relevant all the time. Um, and so I felt, it felt great to, to perform that song and to, to you know, that they had, that, that, that they wanted to include messages like that in the movie. Well, that's kind and of And singing, singing with a 90-piece orchestra wasn't yeah. bad either, I have to say. <laughs> It's um, kind of a good uh, lead segue. Would, would anybody like to hear her sing that song? Okay. All right, it's early on a Saturday morning, so you'll have to forgive me. <clears throat> The earth is just a dead thing you can claim But I know every rock and tree and creature Has a life, has a spirit, has a name You think the only people who are people Are the people who look and think like you But if you walk the footsteps of a stranger You'll learn things you never knew, you never knew. Have you ever heard the wolf cry to the blue corn moon? Or ask the grinning bobcat why he grinned? Can you sing with all the voices of the mountain? Can you paint with all the colors? 
colors of the wind can you paint with all the colors Come run the hidden pine trails of the forest. Come taste the sun-sweet berries of the earth. Come roll in all the riches all around you. And for once, never wonder what they're worth. The rainstorm and the river are my brothers. The heron and the otter are my friends. And we are all connected to each other a circle in a hoop that never ends. How high does a sycamore grow? If you cut it down, then you'll never know. And you'll never hear the wolf cry to the blue corn moon. For whether we are white or copper skin, we need to sing with all the voices of the mountain need to paint with all the colors of the wind you can own the earth and still all you'll own is earth until you can paint with all the colors of the Are we done? Are we... I don't know. We'll find... Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're so nice. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're so kind. Thank you. I don't know about you guys, but I got goosebumps. So <laughs> that was amazing. Amazing. I like. Get teared up a little bit, but you know it's okay. I gotta compose myself. So, question. Oh, you mean to the song itself? No changes to the song. That that was the song they played for me in Alan's studio, and I actually have a cassette. A, yes, a cassette tape of Alan singing the song so I could hear it and learn it. <laughs> um, but no, the song didn't change at all. Um, I mean, the, the movie hadn't been written yet when I first sang it. We had right back there. Yep, you. You've already gone over a lot of the filmography that you've done. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Oh, that's a really good question. Something um, that she's proud of that kind of went under the radar. Oh, you know, well, I don't exactly know what is under the radar, but um, <laughs> I mean, I've done a lot of, uh, uh, you know, as I said, off-Broadway and regional productions of things that maybe didn't get as much um, notice as, you know, some, like, something like Les Miserables and, you know, big Broadway show, but, um, hmm, that's a very good question. I don't know, nothing comes to mind right away. I mean, I did, uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess Assassins, this production that I've been talking about a lot, because it's my mo the most recent thing I did, you know, was not under the radar in New York City, but probably in the rest of the world it was. Um, and, you know, I, I think some of that kind of work is the work I'm most proud of in a, in a way, you know, just, I don't know, yeah. Sure, all right, let's go right over here and then we'll come back to you. <clears throat> Oh, 
gosh. Okay. Um, what was it like working with Disney? It was great. I mean, I had a, so much fun in the in the studio. Um, they were all really great to me. It was. It's a lot. I mean, there's the 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 writers. Obviously, there's there were two directors, and there was a whole lot of studio executives and the animators, and you know everybody. So the whole lineup of people who are all giving you notes on every word and line, every take <laughs> that I did. And I remember, because they all have these charts with each line and they write little notes next to it. And then you, you do a take and then you come out and they give you lines and on this and, and they have storyboards so you can see what physically the character will be doing in the song. And, and I can remember one day, I, you know, the, the notes were coming at me and I was trying to do them all. I'm very diligent and I try, I'm very obedient. And I remember the, the conductor, a um, wonderful man named David Friedman, he followed me into the, vo the vocal booth and closed the door because nobody can hear you if the mic's not on. And uh, he said, just ignore everything they just said to you and just sing it. And so I did, and then I, they, I, when I was done, they were like, that's it, that was great! <laughs> <laughs> of course, I still had to go back and correct things and change things and whatever, but yeah. <laughs> oh, and what's my favorite Disney movie? Oh, God, I don't know. Well, I don't know if would this count as... I guess it does. I, I, I have a very special fondness for Toy Story. <laughs> Which came out the same year as Pocahontas, actually. <laughs> okay. Right, well, being, a, being a fellow theater kid myself, I've also I've been looking at, I've also performed performed the work of Alan Men Alan Menken, uh -huh. before, so I've done, done two drugs in little shops and I nice. extras from Pippin. So what I'm curious about is what was it like the experience of working directly with Alan Menken and Stephen Schwartz? Like, were you and before that, were you? Familiar? Before you work with them, were you familiar with their work? Yeah, well, I actually had worked with Stephen. I think that's how I got involved in this in the first place. I did a show called Rags that, oh my goodness, really? Wow, first of all, you're too young to have seen it. And it played four performances on Broadway. Um, it, a great score, but Stephen Schwartz wrote the lyrics for that. So that's. That was one of my first Broadway shows, and he, it's how I got to know him then. And Alan, I kind of knew a little just from around the New York theater community, but I'd never worked with him. I loved working with them. They were, <laughs> Alan is hilarious, um, and Stephen is just a great artist and lyricist and, you know, just a dear person. Um, so I, it was really, it was really a pleasure. I don't have one single bad memory from that whole experience, which is great. Because it could be very high pressured, you know, <laughs> there could be a lot of grumpy people, and, but, it went, but never. It was always a, just a positive experience. Okay. Was it? You. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. She asked what about, uh, I played a small part in the movie Enchanted, and how did that come about? Um, well, that was a kind of inside joke for those of you who saw the movie. It was populated with Disney princesses. And it was really an inside joke because you not only, you would really have to know who were the actors and actresses who voiced those characters to recognize the people when they showed up on film. Um, so, how, how, I, they asked me, because I'm a Disney princess, how they chose the particular moment and part that I played in it. I think they might, must have thought it was funny. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it was, it was just a, it was an inside joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well, I don't, I don't sing when I'm driving in my car, partly because I rarely, I live in New York City, so I'm rarely driving a car. <laughs> um, you know, I love such a range of music. I, you know, I love, you know, there's lots of theater music, obviously, that I love, but there's also lots of pop music, and 
and you know writers that I love like Joni Mitchell and Tom Waits and Laura Nero and I love singing those songs. I love songs that have great lyrics. Like I said before, let tell stories, you know, and that's what I'm always drawn to. And I don't care what genre it is or who wrote it. If it's got a story to tell, I love to sing it. The green shirt. Thank you for asking that. Um, I did meet Allison. I did meet at her. She she didn't work on the show. I mean, she made herself available to the writers when they had questions, and um, you know, she was at first because she's not a person from the theater. So she <laughs> she told the story. Actually, apparently, there were many people who approached her about doing a film adaptation of her book, and she thought. No, she was too nervous because it was her story about somebody taking that and putting it on film. Um, so when she was approached by these writers to make a musical adaptation, she thought, well, that's a terrible idea. And if it's, um, and because it's the theater, if it's bad, it'll go away and no one will have ever heard of it. So, <laughs> so at first she was sort of like, she didn't really understand the process. They were nervous about her coming in and like looking at early versions of it when we were doing it in workshops and stuff because she, it, it had to be explained to her, this is an early version, it's gonna change a lot. And, but she kind of got it and in the end she just, obviously it wasn't bad and it didn't go away. And it was much loved, and I think it made sales of her book go through the roof. Um, and in fact, I went to a bookstore in New York. I wanted to, get, she was coming to a show, and I wanted to get her to sign a clean copy of it, not my copy that I'd written notes in. And um, so I went to this bookstore in my neighborhood, and I said, was looking for it, and I said, do you have a copy of Fun Home? And they said, you know, we keep selling out of it, and I don't know why. And I thought, mm, I know why. <laughs> um, but, um, so yes, yeah, so she was around, and she came to the show a lot. She came with her brothers. She came with people from her town of Beach Creek, where the book is largely set. Um, and it was very, very meaningful to her. And she's a wonderful, wonderful person and uh, an incredible artist. I mean, if you don't know her work, you should seek it out because she's, a, a, especially all of you who come to Comic-Con must be, might, must like comics and cartoons. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't read it, read it. Yeah. Um, in the back and then we'll come up to you. Well, um, I saw it at its premiere, <laughs> and then I had a daughter, <laughs> um, so she watched it a lot, and I often watched it with her. I couldn't tell you how many times, but I don't think I've seen it since she's grown up, <laughs> um, but I do think it's a wonderful movie. I really do. What did she think about it? I mean, was she like... Well, not when she was little. I will tell you one funny story. When she was really little, they, um, they've just released the Lion King video. And we were at somebody's house and they were put the Lion King video on. And I, she must have been, I don't know, not, she couldn't have been more than three years old. Um, and uh, there was a trailer for the Pocahontas video that was coming. And the soundtrack to this little trailer was Colors of the Wind. And I watched her watching this because I thought, I wonder if she's going to recognize my voice. And she was sitting on the floor and she sat up and her eyes got really wide and I started to, my heart was bursting. And then she went, John Smith. <laughs> So, I don't know if that answers your question, but it didn't really mean that much that it was her mom. 
<laughs> I think until she became an adolescent and her, and her, her friends who, you know, you want to impress when you're an adolescent went, your mom spoke on, is that so cool? And then she thought, oh, I guess that's cool. <laughs> You're done? Okay. Here, and then we'll come over there. Yep. Do you have like a favorite line that you delivered or phrase that you thought was memorable that you felt like when you like acted out your like movie character? So do you have a favorite line or phrase that you've said? I think I do. I mean, hmm, I'm not sure. You mean in Pocahontas or in my whole life? Wow, I have to think about that for a while. I, nothing that comes to mind, you know, I, as I said, I've been lucky. I've done a lot of great writing, and so it's hard to pull things out of context, you know what I mean? But let me, I'm going to think about that. I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> I had a question over here. <gasps> no. Oh my God, that's amazing. Wow, okay, so just to give you a little background, in the show Fun Home, I played Helen Bechtel, who's Allison's mother. And they're, they came from a town called Beach Creek, which is right near State, State College, right? And Helen had dreams of being an actress until she wound up in this little town with her husband Bruce and became an English teacher, but she still did community theater. And you did theater with her. That's incredible. I never met her. I mean, it was a very interesting thing playing a real person and not a historic character, but just a real person. Um, she passed away while we were working on the piece between like our first reading and our next reading. Um, there was a moment we did this lab um, at the public theater and Allison had said, should I bring my mother? And they were like, no, please <laughs> don't bring your mother. <laughs> wait, wait. Um, and, uh, so, and then she passed away. So. She never saw it, and, which I think actually is a good thing. Um, her story is, if you read the book, you'll understand, her story is complicated, and it probably would have been complicated for her to see it on the stage. Um, and, uh, but I did, I have to say, because all these people came from, up from Beach Creek and saw the show, and a lot of them said I was eerily like Helen on stage. And I don't know why that is. I, I mean, I really drew a lot of inspiration from the images of her in Allison's book. She was always like this. She was always she, like she was, I think there's even a line in the book that she always looked like she was just trying to hold herself together. And that I took as a really interesting thing to play and to work on. But um, wow, I, that's amazing. Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we have time for one more question. I promised it right back there in the hat. Didn't you have a question? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, I was curious uh, what we should see on Broadway today. <gasps> oh, there's so much going on on Broadway right now that's so good. Um, I, I mean, uh, there's a lot of really good plays up on Broadway. One of them I'm seeing next weekend called Leopoldstadt, which is Tom Stoppard's most recent and maybe his last play, which is really an autobi largely autobiographical play about his, what happened to his family in Europe. Um, and uh, there's this wonderful production of Death of a Salesman, there is a wonderful production of Into the Woods. Oh. There is, uh, what else, what else, what else? It has opened, yes, I haven't seen it. I cannot tell you what it's like. Um, it's a reimagining of that show. Um, 
what else? I mean, there's a lot. There's, theater has really come back, and there's a lot of great stuff. Off-Broadway happening, you know, all those uh, the off-Broadway theaters, the nonprofits, their seasons are just getting started right now, this fall. So it's, come to New York, come see theater. It's, a, it's really, it's, I feel like something happened in the pandemic where space was opened up for just more voices, more representation, more stories to be heard, and I think it's, it's really great. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't see it on Broadway. I saw it in London. I was working in London when it was on there, and I saw it there, and it was, it was wonderful. Well. Well. So thank you all for your great questions and for your warm welcome. And you will be at your table. I'm going back down to my table and then to you sign have, things, so come say hi. And you, there's more photo ops available. Oh, yes, and there's uh, some photo ops this yeah. afternoon, including one with all of with us all Disney princesses. princesses. <laughs> so make sure you go by and say hello and all that. And let's give a great big round of applause for Judy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, this is Alex Malari Jr. and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to hit that like button, share, and subscribe. Your emperor commands it. Thanks for watching. <laughs>